dedicated to Henry Foreman. In the years of the primal form, the dawn of terrestrial birth, man mastered the mammoth and form. I am my father's son, and his deeds cannot be undone. Yes. Conceited enough to quote my own lyrics to begin episode 135. The reason for this? Well, unbeknownst to me, apparently last week was the 15th anniversary of the release of To the Nameless Dead album. So this podcast will really just be me going over the album To the Nameless Dead, discussing the songs, the songwriting, the atmosphere it was recorded in, where it was recorded, all those kind of things. Um, Primordial is on its way to Messe de Mort, a festival in Canada. So this has disrupted a little bit of the podcast. There won't be... Well, you'll be hearing this on Friday, so you'll have noticed, oh, there isn't his usual nonsense episode on Tuesday. That's because I'm going to be um, sitting in a, uh, a plane traveling transatlantic. And if for some reason that plane uh, crashes into the deep, cold, blue ocean and you hear my voice on Friday, won't well, that be spooky? Yes, indeed it will. Like an episode of The Twilight Zone or something. Speaking of which, I'm being sleeping... Uh, these days, listening to old 1960s and 70s, sometimes even late 50s, um, radio broadcasts of the Twilight Zone. You can get a good eight hours on some YouTube channels. There you go. Have a listen. You'll be surprised at some of the famous names that you can come across um, acting out parts in them. So there is, of course, other stuff that I probably should be talking about. Um, if you do want to follow me on Instagram, it's nemthiangle underscore primordial and primordial underscore official. If you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash Alan Averill, all sorts of other stuff, other demos, old stuff, random unheard things, other podcast discussions going on over there. Go and have a look if you want to do that kind of thing. But of course, if my plane has crashed, um, won't do me much good, will it? If you join to join the Patreon um, after my untimely death. You know, maybe we might sell more records. I suppose we won't. We might get a few more streams for the guys before they get, I don't know, Ripper Owens or something in to uh, take over. Um, just, if he does take over, please make him take off that monster energy hat. That's all I ask. Um, I've been trying to get my head around the whole FTX crash. I think I kind of understand what's been going on and I would kind of like to do a podcast about that, but I have a feeling... The weekend after this one coming, probably it'll be too late. Something else would have crashed and there'll be something else on the news. But definitely it's very interesting. And the links, the, the tentacles that reach back into government and Ukraine and all sorts of things um, and the pandemic and all sorts of things seem very, very interesting. There's some, there's some dark under, con, undercurrents going on there. But certainly it sort of confirmed the worst doubts, I suppose, of people who doubted what Bitcoin was or who kind of looked suspiciously at the nonsense that NFTs seem to represent and generally viewed the whole thing with a sort of um, scepticism as in who is really driving the ship here and what happens if they drive it off course? How does it protect anyone, etc.? The idea of a decentralized currency and banking system, of course, um, is very appealing, especially if you go back in time and maybe listen to my uh, podcast I did about CBDs, um, not CBDs, central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, um, and the potential for a very great authoritarian structure that they might bring about or what they could represent. Um, it certainly isn't good news uh, when it comes to the halt of that kind of authoritarian impulse by technocratic states and their banking systems as they move to, um, you know, well, they basically move to remove the concept of Bitcoin from our um, from our society. Anyway, yes, I suppose that really, if I'd been more organised, would have been whatever it was I was going to discuss this Friday, but it isn't. It's to the nameless dead, um, the primordial album, the one that kind of broke us through to a new audience, the one that kind of broke us through to another rung up the ladder. Um, it's debatable whether we ever went another rung, but who knows? Anyway, without further procrastination and prognostication, um, this is Agitators Anonymous, episode 135. I hand myself over to myself and potentially myself from beyond the grave. All right, it's been a while. So let's try and do this. Today I'm going to talk about what is the sixth primordial album, To the Nameless Dead. Um, I suppose this is the one that broke us through to a broader audience. I've 
spoken about various other albums over the last few months. Um, of course, not in any particular order, not in any particular system, uh, which you can imagine is my want. But to the Nameless Dead, yes, okay, let's discuss this. The sixth primordial album. This is the gatefold vinyl. I don't know if it's the original or not. Obviously, if you're listening to me, you won't be able to see this, but um, I'm going to be making a few of these video cast discussions looking back through the albums. So the previous album was The Gathering Wilderness, which um, I suppose for some people who were uh, primordial traditionalists, maybe they prefer. It's not without its flaws. I'll discuss that album again some other time. But it wasn't quite sonically quite what we wanted. In the end, the mix was a little bit rushed, although it has an incredible sort of claustrophobic, dark, dank, gritty atmosphere. Um, it wasn't entirely what we wanted. And so in the interim period between The Gathering Wilderness and what became To The Nameless Dead, we were trying to source and look for new studios. And that's when um, I came across Fole Studios in Wales. I'm not quite sure which band had been there. Uh, and I really liked the sound on their records. But this history or the studio had a long history going back to the 70s. Um, Dave Anderson, who replaced Lemmy and Hawkwind, as I understand, he owned the studio. Bands like My Bloody Valentine had been there. Um, uh, Electric Wizard had been there. Napalm Death had been there. Uh, but the studio had a sort of a lot of history. And what the guys wanted to do, what Kieran and Paul wanted to do, was to um, be able to literally load the gear that we had, get in the car and go on the ferry. The ferry from Dublin to Wales is only, I don't know, two and a half hours or something. And then drive, literally, from the ferry port to the studio. And so the studio is in the middle of nowhere. I'm not going to try and pronounce the name of the studio, but it's in the middle of nowhere in Wales. And um, I booked the studio in full uh, with, as I said, the intention of us loading in some elements of our gear. Um, and the person I booked it with, I suppose, was a, a young Chris Fielding at the time. And it's a strange record, or it's, it's not a strange record, how shall I describe? It seems like Primordial has the look that every second album goes smoothly, every other one is a fucking nightmare. And this was one that went smoothly. We did it in the, the summer, the sun was shining, um, and around the studio it's like two old outhouses, and um, the, the main studio has this incredible atmosphere, and downstairs is full of all these old amps and guitars and old drums and old equipment from Van de Graaff Generator and Hawkwind and all sorts of other stuff, and it really added to the feeling that you were out of the city, out of your comfort zone. And something that's very important for recording an album is to, if you do it in the city where you're from, there's always a temptation to, oh, I'm just going home for dinner. I'm going home back to the family and sitting on the couch and watching TV. And your mind isn't really focused on what you're doing. Sometimes, of course, the temptations of a city can mean that you just sit in a pub after every other take. But it can be very worthwhile to get out into the countryside. And that's exactly where Fall was. And... Um, we'd made one album that thus far for Metal Blade, which had been a moderate success in The Gathering Wilderness. But To the Nameless Dead was the one that sort of broke us through to a broader audience. I mean, that much was self-evident in the festival bookings that we got following it. You can see how you went from being on the fourth stage or the third stage, or not at all, to being on the second stage or at the beginning of the first stage. And slowly it was like, oh, we're being asked to play at Grass Pop and... Um, you know, Vakken and some of the bigger festivals had noticed. I think it was the first album we had that charted in a few places, if I'm not mistaken. For whatever that's worth, I suppose in 2008 it was worth a little bit more than it is now. But we went over with our gear. Um, it sounds quite incredible, but I think in the end To the Nameless Dead was made as in recorded and mixed and all out the door in about 10 and a half days, 11 days. Um, Chris can correct me in the comments. Um, but we were never a band that fucked around. We didn't, we didn't um, use click tracks, we didn't cut and paste, we didn't even use a metronome. And generally, we were, you know, we were reasonably well rehearsed with this one. Like, we had most of the songs written. Sometimes we're 60, 70% ready, 
and we leave 10, 20, 30 percent to being in the studio. I think that's important because as a musician, it forces you to think on your knees. It forces you to react. It forces you to be proactive with the songs. You're not just, you know, robot like going through the motions. So that was very important always to leave a little bit to the studio. But this album, we were pretty prepared, as I remember. We didn't we weren't making stuff up on the fly. So in the morning, we set up the drums and we got there first day for the whatever. Let's just say it was a Monday. Um, and by the end of the evening, I think we pretty much had all of the drum tracks nailed. Most of them are first takes, maybe second takes. We were all playing in the same room together. Um, you know, Simon had a slightly enclosed drum area and we're all playing there surrounded by all the old amps and pianos. And um, it just went very, very smoothly. Um, I mean, um, like I said, we aren't a band who fuck around overdubbing and going over things all of the time. So I seem to remember that in the first day we got everything set up um, and had more or less most of the drum tracks done by the end of the first evening, maybe even the second day. But which and you're just going straight on to bass then so you know you record scratch bass and scratch guitar some of which you might keep if it's well played or sounds okay but generally we'll go back over some things add harmonies with the guitars other layers but from the start you could tell i you have this feeling like oh this album is going to click this is going to fall into place i'd already been preparing the artwork and the aesthetics and the ideas that were going behind the lyrics but certainly um, it had a very positive feeling right from the outset. And I think we had more days booked than we did. But in the end, we did the first whole the recording in the first six days, um, seven days. I think we came in a Monday and left on a Saturday. And that included, um, I don't think it included vocals, maybe some scratch vocals, but certainly um, within the first week, uh, six days, we were more or less done with everything. There was a few little things to add, a few little guitar parts, but um, that's just kind of how it went down. Uh, it went down very quickly. Um, most of the songs, as I said, were pretty well rehearsed. Um, they've been songs we've been playing for a while. We were quite um, committed to the idea of the record being a little bit more forceful, a little bit more sonically dynamic. Um, you know, some people might wonder about the heavy metal, the more heavy metalisms that were present in the in the record. And certainly Primordia was not a band that had many choruses before or big middle sections. So the fact that Empire Falls, which became one of the biggest songs we ever made, um, had this huge, big heavy metal chorus was, um, it, I'm not going to say it was done deliberately or on purpose or it was just a natural songwriting progression, I think. But certainly from my point of view, um, and the same with Heathen Tribes, for example. Uh, you can see Rome Burns has no chorus. It, it's a curious song. But Heathen Tribes, I wanted to make um, to make more memorable choruses. More, I'd watched, been at festivals and seen the reaction to um, to some of the bands, uh, the bigger bands. And of course, there are bands that had always grown up with the maidens and the priests and all that kind of thing. But I wanted maybe in my way to make the music a little bit less sodden and obscure, uh, to be a little bit more dynamic and effervescent and have this sort of, you know, f rebellious vitality to it. And, you know, where is the fighting man, etc. And it's it's not that... Um, it's not that anything was done, you know, in a sort of uh, preemptive way or I thought about it too much, but definitely the album has a more um, dynamic old school heavy metal approach. You can see choruses in Traitor's Gate and um, that kind of thing. Of course, with Primordial, not everything, not every, we don't really plan, plan things. We don't sit and go, this album is going to be more doomy. This album is going to be more that or whatever. They just sort of... They, you know, the chips fall the way they fall. But certainly we hit a really instant groove. It was great working with Chris, such a mellow, calm uh, influence, who was also a musician who could also pick out a note and go, well, what about this? What about that? But a very calming influence on um, a traditional dynamic in Primordial where we would have been at quite at loggerheads and quite uh, arguing and fighting a lot. He was a very... Um, calming presence in that and you know worked his fingers to the bone with long nights um, in order to get what we got and so we left the first recording session of six days with I guess 70 percent of the work done um, as I remember we left it a couple of weeks got used to the demos I you know got used to some of the um, got used to some of the scratch vocals uh, quite where those tapes are now I don't know um, but 
I came back, laid down the vocals in a day and a half, maybe two days. I tend not to want to fuck around with the singing. I don't like going over and over and over and over things. I, sometimes I've done songs. I mean, I remember, um, I remember Rome Burns, for example. You know, the the main vocals coming together more or less in one or two takes. Um, the the sort of whispering, gathering chorus in the middle, layering that. These are ideas that come in the studio. But generally, Empire Falls, you know, you know, uh, the graves, blah, 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 whatever the whatever the fucking lyrics are. I should probably should have looked at them before trying to sing some of them. Um, or I could have looked in the record. A cold wind is blowing. Yes, indeed. Um, and I had a very definite idea of what I wanted to do. And once you're in the zone, once you're in the mood, um, once you're feeling powerful and strong and you're feeling like you can r rattle through them all I tend to try and just br let's go let's go let's go let's go break the back of all of the work um, and just get really really into it and do a few of hours work and you can have three quarters of an album done so I think by the end of the second day we were ready to mix and so the record was mixed in then following four or five days now if I remember it was just myself and Kieran who mixed this record um, it, mixing is a curious thing. Sometimes it helps to be there, sometimes not. Sometimes, um, I suppose, it depends on the characters and the personalities, the people who are mixing, the time, um, the stress, the pressure. Certainly with Redemption, which I'll do another one of these on, it was much more uh, stressful. And we were mixing right up until 5, 6 a.m. when we had to drive out and get the ferry and everybody is narky and tired and all sorts of stuff. But this was relatively plain sailing and I think after 11 days it was done 10 11 days it was done and I knew we were sitting on something really special and at the time prior to Gathering Wilderness the very great Michael Trengart uh, rest in peace brother um, had signed us to before the Gathering Wilderness and this was kind of the album that had repaid his faith, so to speak. Gathering Wilderness, as I said, was a, was a, was a su success. But this was the one I remember going over to do press for it uh, in Germany. And there was about 10 or 12 or 15 people at the listening session. And we had some warehouse uh, listening session and him leaning over and going, oh, man, you've you've hit it now. This is it. Empire Falls. Like, this is a huge heavy metal song. And that was mighty praise indeed. And it's sort of, you could feel how things were beginning to build. And I, if I'm not mistaken, it got number one in the sound check in all of the big German magazines, all four, um, which was sort of like a clean sweep of all of the uh, top spots. And that summer we were playing everywhere. I think we did 20, 24 festivals. One particular week we went from Hoover Festival in Norway to Grass Pop to... Um, up from the ground festival to fall of or summer breeze to just five huge shows in a row and you come home in the sun and you realize wow i think we just played to about fifty thousand people all total or 40 or something like this and it was we'd been peripheral before that but this was us kind of coming in from the cold into the main stream i suppose and the album that did it um it makes sense that it was this album it makes sense that when you go to a festival now and maybe you're you know, skulking around, having a beer in the beer tent and they put on Empire Falls. It's the hit. And I was doing little parenthesis there if you're just listening. Um, it's the hit. And then there's others kind of, you know, Gallows Hymn became its own sort of song. Um, Heathen Tribes, I wanted to write a sort of antidote to what I saw as the sort of kind of flippant sort of um, meaningless... Uh, empty rhetoric of some of the pagan metal scene at the time, uh, in my opinion, that maybe wasn't taking the subject matter quite that seriously. I decided I'm going to make a sort of an anthem, a sing sort of a sing-along anthem, I suppose, that, but has a serious content. And like I said, there's elements of that throughout what is a very serious album, To the Nameless Dead, um, but there is elements of the bigger chorus of our influences that were the Sabbath and the Maiden and the Priest stuff coming a little bit maybe to the to the fore. The tone is a bit clearer and punchier. The bass is up front, the drum. Everything about the tone is much more dynamic and together than, for example, Gathering Wilderness. Um, and to me, those two albums sit perfectly together. They have a similar... One is the sort of, I suppose, the squally shower of a day, the sodden earthen storm. 
And the next day is, well, what could it be? What could it be? I don't know, whatever the opposite to that is. The next day is the, the lightning storm, the uplifting... What am I talking about? Who knows? Anyway, they go together very well. I probably should have thought of that, about that again before I started off on this um, content creation. So to the Nameless Dead, the Sixth Time, what was the, the subject matter, the idea behind it? Well, um, uh, as odd as it may seem, I'd been doing some work for Marduk on tour, um, been thinking about uh, where we should go after the Gathering Wilderness. And so, you know, the Gathering Wilderness is very much based on themes of alienation, martyrdom, of, um, I suppose it has a red, it, it had a resignation to it. Uh, it had a quite a sullen, dark atmosphere. To the Nameless Dead was more like the rebellious answer. It was the, um, you cannot conquer the indomitable human spirit. It was, um, it was about the phoenix rising up from the ashes, so to speak. So... I was on tour with Marduk and every day Morgan would go, come on, get up out of bed. We're going to go and look at the tomb of such and such in such and such or a statue to a certain warrior or something. Or every day he knew he's a walking ency historic encyclopedia. And every day he would get me up and go, come on, we're going to look at this. And, you know, it, he was partly to he partly inspired some of the. Um, the principles behind the album in the sense that the idea that who, wherever you may be, lost in whatever city, country, you could go to the town square and look at the statues of the people over the town square and wonder, now who is this? Or what was the part they had to play in the building of this city, of this nation, of this state? And I became very interested in the idea of nations and states that have disappeared, whether it's Lombardy, Burgundy, all these, I don't know, all these, um, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, all of these... Um, all of these peoples that had returned to the dust of history, about their songs, about forgotten languages, about the movement of borders. And that's kind of what To the Nameless Dead is about. It's about the lives of young men and women that were given to the movement of borders of nations and states that no longer exist. So that's why you have in the, the very extensive sort of uh, big CD book, you will see lots of uh, maps, um, old maps from the 18th and 19th century, looking at um, all the borders that had been and disappeared. Um, it's an, it was an extensive book, and the first time that um, I'd really had free license to collect all of the photos and images that I wanted for the inside. Of course, it's still serious, very, very serious subject matter, but the idea that um, the nation building, state building, not necessarily the age of empire or the age of, let's say, expeditions of the 15th or 16th century. This was more like 18th, 17th and up to the beginning of the century, the 19th century uh, empire building and the establishment of nation states. Being from Ireland, of course, we have our own checkered history with our own borders, our own history and nation state. Um, but I didn't, it's a, it's a common misconception about Primordial that the lyrics are about Irish history. They aren't. They're, there's a universalism to them, whether you were from Palestine or Peru or, I, I don't know, Siberia maybe. You had your own internal, you had your own, the struggles of your own nation state throughout the years, the own sense of martyrdom, the own sense of um, sacrifice that those states were established under, um, under ty tyranny, under um, rebellion, under all those things. So Empire Falls is was the first song I think that we wrote the open, the, the the super catchy kind of metal riff um and the big chorus and I mean I suppose it's self-explanatory every empire in this world will fall um whether it is you know in Carthage between the Romans and the Greeks or the Macedonian empire or the, all of these empires eventually they fall now these over the last year in, under the terms of all of these strangeness that we're living under, many, many people DM me with my own lyrics, which I find <laughs> kind of curious. But thank you very much for reminding me of foretelling our doom. Um, but Empire Falls is pretty is a pretty self-explanatory song. Gallows Hymn was inspired by, uh, I suppose, a run of festivals leading up to that where you'd be sitting with very, you know, new and old friends, maybe at a festival. 
uh, maybe after you've played, maybe before you've played, um, and you would be um, you would be putting the world to right, setting everything in order. You'd be sitting there having your beers, having your laughs, having your chats, and every year you'd see the same people. And it kind of struck me that somehow we were putting the world to rights, going back to where we were, living our lives the same and coming back the next year, just a little bit older. So it's a song about mortality. It's a song about growing old. It's a song about making amends for things that you've done in the past. Failure's Burden is a sort of a continuation of this. It's a song that I like a lot that we never really got to play live um, for whatever reason. Um, and it's one of those songs that when you set out writing the lyrics, you want to set, uh, it, it's more a visual song. The words are, mm, you know, there's not a necessarily a very intense, straight meaning to them. They're open to interpretation. It's more about setting an atmosphere. And I just wanted to get this again. If Gallows Hymn is the sense of the young ageing, then Failure's Burden is the sense of elderly reg regret. Or when you reach the, so the twilight of your years, the idea that it must be to look back on your life and wonder if the things that you've done have been uh, correct. You know, and every man is evil, every man a liar, and every word he speaks is kindling to the fire. A little bit I'd stolen from Woven Hand there, or 16 horsepower, sorry. But that was kind of the idea. You're looking back over your regrets as you get old. As Rome burns, well, I suppose as Rome burns is, uh, again, along the same lines as Empire Falls and is very poignant in the circumstances that we're living in now. Um, the idea that Nero fiddled while Rome burned, we were the collective Nero, um, who I suppose I looked at modern European society and saw the things that we seem to be obsessed by and the things that we had um, cast to the side from the past as deciding they had no meaning anymore and that we'd been very hasty in doing so and that they ultimately they would be our own demise, whether it was the embrace of, um, you know, materialism and all this kind of thing. So I suppose... It's a song about people losing. Again, I carried this force into other albums and it was on Exile, but the idea that there was a collective malady, a sort of soul sickness at the heart of um, society or the West or whatever. Um, but again, it could be open for anybody. I got letters from people in the Middle East who found their own nation and state within the lyrics. And that's always what I wanted to do was to make it a universalism to the ideas of martyrdom um, or sacrifice or any of these things. Um, Heathen Tries, as, as I've explained, is supposed to be meant to be a sort of a pagan anthem, like a name check, a roll call of different, um, you know, the Teutoburg Forest, Sintra in Portugal, and places where we'd been in the beginning of the band in the 90s that were very important to our, um, I suppose, our formative years. Traitor's Gate. Um, again, a poignant kind of song. Um, Traitor's Gate is a song about, I suppose, lying politicians and lying institutions of power that manipulate and send young men and young women to their death um, for causes they don't really understand. Um, and I wanted, again, to have this very, very vivid um, descriptive language. I can see the gallows, cold hands, tighten old rope, Young men hung in the fetid breeze like rotten fruit too ripe for harvest. They marched us through the streets, heralded our death, proclaimed our end and brought us to our knees. So you have a form of rhyming um, rhyme there, but it's a loose kind of rhyming in the, in the hard and soft consonants. But the, what I wanted to do was very vividly describe in an almost cin cinematic way the idea of... Um, I suppose you would have seen it on the streets of Phnom Penh or the streets of um, Santiago or the streets of any European city when there was pogroms, whether it was in Russia, the, on the Bolshevik, something. The, uh, these, these sort of idea of um, people being so anesthetized to the most absolutely brutal displays of tyranny, um, whether it was, as I said, the young men hanging in the square, um, and so I wanted to make this very vivid um, descript descriptive language. 
and borders swell like the oceans, nations swept away in the steel rain, wounds carved in the earth. The silent hands of genocide map the years, forgotten legacies of dust, people remembered in nothing but fragments of language, voices of song and shards of military rust. So you're getting a rhyming sort of sense of a loose rhyme again, but I, the idea of invoking dust, rust, um, this idea of ageing militarism, of um, rusted gears and grinding mechanisms moving across the soil. And that's kind of what you want to do. Sometimes the lyrics don't always have an exact precise meaning, but they have their... They, is it anomatopoeia? I don't know. Descriptive language that sounds like the thing that it's describing. Maybe that's incorrect. Somebody can correct me in the comments. Traitor's Gate, yes. Um, the Rising Tide is a mistake, actually, in the sense that I went to master the album in a very big studio in Germany on my own, um, not knowing exactly what I was doing. And Kieran gave me very specific instructions for The Rising Tide. It's got to be in this key. And so you've got to pitch shift the key down. It's just a, like a droning note. Um, and of course, I fucked it up and got it wrong. So it's actually a mistake as an intro. Yes, uh, my fault. Uh, it's supposed to be in a slightly different key leading into Traitor's Gate, but I didn't really understand that at the time. So, No Nation on This Earth, I suppose, is a, a hymn or a paean to, again, the sacrifice of young men and young women, maybe inspired a little bit by Irish history, a tiny bit, but not essentially. It's a kind of, it's a song for the small nations of the world, the peripheral nations, the nations that have been put upon by empire, put upon by colonialism throughout the world. So it was a, it's a hymn to the, um, I suppose, the resistance of the small nation in the face of overwhelming odds. And I suppose it's a, it's a, it's a, again, it's a, a call out to the indomitable human spirit. That's kind of what I was trying to do. And again, um, you know, the riff at the end, do no 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 is this sort of we call it the seasick riff, but it's really classic heavy metal. And these are wounds made by cold hands, has to be that whole two verse there is my one of my favorite pieces of primordial music to sing. Um, and one of my favorite parts live. It just really hits home. Um, and again, these are cold hands that know the bite of steel, hands that have rendered life extinct and punished the weak at heart. Again, it's my, I suppose, my rather grim love letter to the resistance of small nation states at the hands of tyranny. And that was kind of the theme of the whole album. I mean, the cover, you know, this uh, Lady Justice has been raped, truth assassin, sort of metallic and justice for all feel vaguely on the cover wasn't my intention at the time what I was I was quite influenced by uh, a lot of neo folk and industrial music aesthetically and I wanted to steer clear of the sort of bright colored um, rather garish metal albums the rather typical um, things of the time and make this kind of cobalt gray cover uh, which was done by Paul McCarroll at Unhinged and I think he did a great job here capturing the um, the essence of the of the album. Of course, the idea of this female figure of justice has a sort of, again, a call out to the sort of feminine, uh, traditional, I suppose, feminine role and aspect in pre-Christian societies um, encapsulated in this modern statue with the flag lowered, as in defeated, set to the backdrop of ruined buildings. Um, and, and returns me back to the idea about statues and their um, their representation, their meaning, and the people who erected them and what for, which I suppose became more pertinent as people began to pull them down over the following decade. Um, the box the box set is um, a sort of a, a, a different vibe to the album aesthetically. Um, these are the skulls on the front and the flame are taken from a grave in Glasnevin Cemetery in Ireland where uh, most of our, I suppose you could call them our rebels and um, such are buried. And we sat on the record, it came out and it was clear that we moved up, I suppose. We didn't write the album with that intention. It was the, it was a, 
um, a side effect of making an album that had this dynamic sense of purpose. And I think it really solidified our uh, reputation as being as you know as not being a peripheral band anymore a band that could move through the you know the festival slots pull a few more people live that kind of thing and certainly for me it was a moment where i had to step up to the plate in regards to singing i had to understand that uh, the party had to come afterwards excuse me the party had to come a little bit more afterwards um even though some of you may have found me doing that beforehand but Standing on bigger stages had a greater responsibility. And I realized, like, like, okay, what are you, a hobbyist or a musician? You need to start being a musician. I'd realized that with the Gathering Wilderness, but I suppose lacked quite the confidence to do it um, with strength and vigor. That may sound strange to some of you, but definitely there was an element of like, oh, I'm, you know that moment where you're going to, are you going to sing the bit of the Coffin Ships in the right key or not? It's quite hard. Now I look forward to doing it and doing it um, with you know, gusto, or um, you look forward to the difficult moments. And that was that was because you'd stepped up to the plate of being a musician. Um, and so To the Nameless Dead was a huge learning curve for the band. We would show up for gigs and see other bands who seemed to be not doing quite as well when they'd have crew, they'd have lots of professional this, that, and the other. And we were still just doing everything ourselves. Um, we were still kind of, I suppose, that sort of fly by the seat of your pants Irish attitude, um, which sometimes is great. And other times you realize like, oh, right, a little bit of, um, you know, Teutonic or Germanic efficiency wouldn't go amiss. So we learned a lot in the record uh, with this record. It elevated our status, I suppose, in, in, in the metal scene. Um, it's the last album where I think that I put explanations of the songs and paragraphs afterwards, uh, like as if it wasn't enough that I'd just written the lyrics. There were little cryptic explanations underneath, um, which I think I stole from Virgin Steel, maybe. That kind of thing. The I suppose that was a sort of micromanagement that wasn't needed fundamentally when you look back on it. But it's still one of my favourite records that we made. It's the breakthrough record. Um, record I'm very very proud of still when I listen to this day it gives me goosebumps it has a massive rebellious nature to it that I think was not fantastical like a lot of traditional heavy metal themes of rebellion are mired in fantasy or uh, but this is a brutally grim and realistic album it it it's more or less I was trying to say in a way to people that uh, this is not a band who sings about romance fantasy escapism or myth or mythology. These are very much songs rooted in the present day or the last hundred years or the elements of sacrifice, martyrdom, history resonate through society now to you, wherever country you may be, wherever you find your place, find yourself, that kind of thing. Um, is it my favourite album? I don't know. I don't know. Some of the songs on it are certainly my favourite to play live and it's one I'm infinitely proud of. The sixth album, To the Nameless Dead.